Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the University of United Methodist Church and welcome you as we come together to celebrate Christ in our life and to celebrate Christ in one another. Let us enter a time of worship and celebration. Let's stand as we begin our worship with our first hymn, number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Turn and wave to one another just for a moment so we see who's here. Thank you. Please be seated. share with you today a, a very familiar verse for most of us, and that's Ecclesiastes 3. And here the prophet tells us, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to pray, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Usually when we look at this particular scripture, this is where we end, but we find that the scripture did not end there. These words are very important to the meaning of seasons and time. When he goes on to say, what does the worker gain from his toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his work. This is the gift of God. May the Lord add his blessing to those who bear and share. 
in its word. It's time of season. I realized that last night as I was in the kitchen making my nightly glass of chocolate milk that I share with Cynthia, and she was busy at the oven, which really surprised me because I didn't think she knew what the oven was. But the fact is, for those of you who know, I do most of the cooking, so don't take offense for her. But she was actually changing the clock, and she says, I like to change one so I actually know what time it is. And so she punched in 11.30, and we finished our chocolate milk, and we went to bed. And this morning, I don't know if you noticed, but the sun came up earlier. I'm not real certain why, but it's that season. The seasons that are upon us. And seasons are something that's part of all of our life. A time to do so many things. And I think the prophet said it best. There's a time for everything under heaven and every matter under the earth. When we look at these words, we have to realize that many of us are itching to get our tomato plants out. For those of you who may have watched Wednesdays in the garden, I talked a little bit about that because I actually recorded it in my garden. And I want you to know that uh, I decided to wait. And so my tomato plants that I had out in the back uh, as I went out yesterday and looked are no longer there. Evidently, I think the squirrels have eaten the tomato plants. So for everything, there's a season and a time. But in this season that we ourselves get so ready for things, we realize that in the state of Texas, when do you plant your garden? And you wait for Easter. Because that's the last breeze. You wait for the mesquite tree to blossom. You wait for the old native pecan tree to come out and leave. This is when you know there will be no more freezes because they're symbols of a season. I personally call this the season of the Texas Arctic Spring, where it may be 80 degrees today and tomorrow it will be snowing. And it may be. But I got a word from my youngest daughter, Sarah, and this is the quote from my oldest grandchild, Adley. And she says, spring is just another word in, for summer in Texas. Now, I don't know where she heard that from. I know as a grandfather, I can tell you that I have the most beautiful, the smartest grandkids in all the world, just like you do. But I keep going, where did she hear that from? Because she's not celebrated enough Texas springs and summer to be able to note what's going on. But the object of season is so true because we face these seasons differently. We can't wait for things. We are in that age of instant gratification where we want everything and we want it now. And on top of that, we want it our way. Remember those seasons in your life? You couldn't wait till you're 16 so you can start driving. Remember those words, and I remember them well from some of my daughter's friends when they were turning 16, and they looked at me and said, now you've got to let them date because they're 16. And I looked and said, why? Is it written someplace? I said, what if they waited until they were 21? A father's dream. But the fact of it is, is that we put everything upon a season of time. And sometimes it's an age. Other times it's a season of what we see outside. But we have to ask why. If we look through the Bible, we'll find that there are many people that by waiting and waiting for God have been blessed. At the same time, there are those that chose not to wait for God, and things didn't go that well. For one, from 1 Samuel, I kind of want to relate the story of King Saul. King Saul was going to war, but he was told to wait seven days for the prophet Samuel to show up. So Samuel, or Saul, gathered his army out in the field. They were waiting. They were getting things ready to go to war. They were waiting on the great victory because God would be on their side. 
And that seventh day came, but Samuel did. And at that time, some of his men decided that God wasn't listening to Samuel, so they began to desert him. And Saul looked over and said, you know what? We need to move forward. We've waited on God, and we've waited on Samuel, and this isn't happening. So he went out and he picked the sacrifice that would be done before the battle, and he sacrificed it to God. And about that time, who shows up? The Samuel. And the word says this. He looked and he says, Saul, that's a foolish thing that you've done. You've not kept the command that the eternal, your true God, gave you. He was willing to establish your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom, your dynasty, will not last. He has found a man who seeks his will and has appointed him king over all the people instead of you because you've not kept to what the eternal one commanded the season the season was for king saul to wait on what god told him would happen the season was not a test for saul the season was a simple commandment that was looking and saying if you do these things not only will you have the victory but if you do these things, your dynasty, your kingdom will last forever. How many of us can relate to that story of Saul? How many of us in church can look back and we've prayed for things and prayed for things, waiting for it to happen, and it didn't happen in our timeline, which is usually now. And someone gets their feathers ruffled and they leave forgetting that what they have left is not a church and just a church family. What they have left was a commitment to God. A season, a time. A time where we look at the innocence, but we look also at the intellect of one who can say, spring is another word for summer in Texas. Moving on so you can feel good about yourself is not that which brings about and promotes God. God has given us promises within the Bible. And in those promises, he's told us what he would do for us if we wait. The first is he promises to reward and bless our faithfulness. Reward and bless our faithfulness. How many of us have said, Lord, if it's your will, Lord, in your time, if you'll do these things and actually wait. How many of us have said those words and then forgotten we've ever said it and the next thing we know we find this bounty of blessings which have fallen upon us? In Psalms we hear, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. We sit back today and we shake our head going, will the church survive? But yet God looks to us and says, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to put up with the onslaught? Are you willing to be persecuted? Are you willing to do these things so that you actually see the wicked truly cut off? Or like a child with a temper tantrum, do we stomp our feet and say, well, if this is what there is, then what's the use? And I know you're not saying that, but there's many in the world that look to the church and they go, what's the use? Where is the God that they pray to? Why is he sitting silent? When in all these things, if they would sit and look around, they would find they're not silent. Things are happening within God and within our lives, which are bringing the joy and the power of God known and back into the life of not only the church, but back into the life of the people of God. In Isaiah, he says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. 
Blessed are all who wait for him. We hear that word a lot nowadays. Justice. But we ourselves, we can see ourselves then as the standard of justice today. Instead of looking at saying, God, make this right. And then waiting to see what God will do. See, waiting and seeing how God will change the heart within humanity to see that justice itself will prevail. We see it within our politics. We see it within our education system. We see it within our system of taxation. We see it in almost everything we do. And we stand up, even as we claim to be God's people, and we demand justice. But are we willing to wait for God to give us the design to that justice? Because he's told us that we'll be rewarded and we'll be blessed in our faithfulness. Where is the faithfulness that we still should hold true to today in our life in the church? The second thing he promises is that he promises to give us what we need to endure. You know, I don't know about you, but I've heard lots of different things about God will give you more than what you can manage. I don't know, but honestly, there have been times that I've been on my knees in tears because God has given me more than what I thought I could manage. But yet within that, I find through that time and through the faithfulness that we endure that we are lifted back up and we are lifted back up more strong with more strength than we had even before. But what's even more meaningful to it is that when we do that, it's always amazing to me that within a month's time, someone comes to me and say, Tom, I'm on my knees. I'm so broken. And I can look and say, let me tell you, I was there too. And let me tell you what God can because when we find ourselves at that point, we also find that we become willing messengers to be able to help those people around us that we never knew. To be able to take the hand of a person who doesn't know a friend. To be able to reach out and to take and to hold. If you had read on in Ecclesiastes 3, you'll find that the prophet continues to say, it is better to have two rather than one. Because with two, you can get warm. But with one, you can't get warm. With two, you can fight off someone who is trying to bring conflict upon you. But alone, you'll probably be beaten. He looks to us and says, a strand of three is not easily broken. He's telling us that when we look and we wait upon God, then in that we gather together in strength. But when we become that loose thread that so many of us play with on our sweaters or our jackets, and we pull the right one, suddenly we start seeing it's unraveling. Is that not what's happened within our lives as well? Especially as we start taking accountability of what God would want within us. And Isaiah again, he says these words, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They renew their strength. That's what happens when our faith continues. That's what happens when we wait upon the Lord is that he strengthens us from within and he allows us to have that strength to be able to walk the path that he has placed upon us. But he also looks and he promises this. He promises to hear us when we speak to him. In Micah he says, but as for me, I will look to the Lord and I will wait for God in my salvation. My God will When we look today at these promises and waiting, do we ever talk to God? Do we ever take that moment to say, not my will, but your will, Lord? Do we ever take that moment 
to say, not my words, Lord, but speak through me the words you want them to hear? Do we ever take that moment within our life when everything's becoming a shamble and not just say, oh God, in a derogatory way, but to actually look to God and thank him and ask God for mercy within our life? This sermon is a sermon of promise. A sermon that says, I will wait and he will bring upon me his salvation. Isn't that why we're really here? To be able to take a moment and look at that promise of salvation. When we realize it's the fourth Sunday of Lent and Easter's coming. Are we seeing that joy of our salvation that was given to us on that Easter sunrise? When the tomb was opened and the curtain was split in half on Good Friday, saying there's no longer separation between human soul and God, but God has made a pathway. Today, even in our numbers, we should be sitting back and going, God, I am so excited about my salvation. To be able to realize that this is not just now, but we're talking about my eternity. But he says to petition him, to petition him in all of our needs, all our wants and desires. And even though the world may seem like darkness around us, when we turn to God and we petition him, we find that we've taken it off our own shoulders and we've given it to God. We should find ourselves a little bit lighter. We should find ourselves a little bit more expectant. One of the phrases that I just found today as we were singing Morning is Broken is that in that song, I believe in the second verse, it goes down to say that this morning when it dawned and it broke an hour earlier, it was the same as on that first day. He's telling us to be able to petition him and give him thanks when you walk out in the evening and you feel that cool, moist air, and you say, thank you, God, for this beautiful evening. When you get up in the morning and you see the start of a new day, and you're able to say, thank you, God, for this new day, we're petitioning him of what our expectation of this day will actually be. In Lamentations, it says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of in that quietness, it means that we wait with a silent expectation. That we don't wish it to happen now. That we don't demand it. But through our petition, we give God thanks for our salvation until the day he calls us home. Or until the day of trumpet sound, he awakens the earth to his coming. You see, many of us are pretty good at waiting. We've waited most of our life. We've waited for things. But no matter who we are, waiting sometimes seems to be painful. It creeps up on us and suddenly it seems unbearable. I don't want to wait anymore. I want it and I want it now. But when that time comes, these promises remind us that if we truly want the blessing of God, then we're to wait upon him. For there is a time and a place for every activity under heaven. There's a time and a place for us to laugh. A time and a place for us to be strong. A time and a place for us to be able to reach out and touch one another. And to celebrate God amongst us. This is the promise of God. That today we rise up and wait for him. And in so doing, give him the glory. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do give you thanks. We give you thanks for you have promised that if we wait upon you, blessings will cover our lives. You have promised us that if we petition you and then wait, that our life will be surrounded by the blessings that you give. You have promised us, O oh Lord, that you will help us to endure, but you've also promised that you made everything beautiful in its time. And that our job is to find joy within our life and upon this earth. 
blessings to wait upon you, O Lord. But bless us with a faith and a faithfulness that helps us to raise our heart and shout to the world that our salvation has come and it's come within you. Amen. Let's stand for our closing hymn number 170. Oh God of Jesus. <laughs> Oh!